Hey guys, so um, we're going to just kind of jump right in today. Yesterday we read about how Odysseus had finally made it back to Ithaca after 20 years and he winds up on um, the island with um, this store of like gold and gifts from the Phaeacians uh, stored in a cave and he goes to meet Eumaeus, his old swine herd, um, who he can trust and he's eating breakfast when his son, who's now in his 20s, shows up. He reveals himself to Telemachus, his son. They have a very tearful, joyful reunion, and they make a plan on how to defeat these suitors who are in his house, kind of taking all of his food and supplies and trying to um, marry his wife. We're going to jump right into today's selection where they're going to put that plan into action. We're almost done reading the Odyssey. We have, after this one, two more reading selections left. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you, this, this selection um, is a little bit sad. Argus is a little bit sad, so... Just be prepared for that. So Odysseus heads for town with Eumaeus, the old swine herd. Remember, Telemachus had already headed back to do his, to do um, his job, which is to hide all the weapons. Outside the palace, Odysseus's old dog Argus is lying at rest as as his long absent master approaches. So Argus, keep in mind, um, Argus is at least twenty. If he was a brand new little puppy when Odysseus left, Argus would be twenty years old. Um, and chances are he was not that young. He was a dog, so he's over 20, which is very old for a dog. While he spoke, an old hound, so while he is Odysseus, an old hound lying near pricked up his ears and lifted up his muzzle. This was Argus, trained as a puppy by Odysseus, but never taken on a hunt before his master sailed for Troy. So he was not quite a year old. He was a puppy, but he was trained, and he was, so he's about 20. The young men, afterward, hunted wild goats with him, and hare and deer, but he had grown old in his master's absence. Treated as rubbish now, he lay at last upon a mass of dung before the gates, manure of mules and cows piled there until field hands could spread it on the king's estate. Abandoned there and half destroyed with flies, old Argus lay. So this part is really sad, like exceptionally sad. Argus is laying there on a, a pile of manure, fertilizer, poop, covered in flies, old and emaciated and just, just wasting away. Um, but when he knew he heard Odysseus's voice nearby, he did his best to wag his tail, nose down with flattened ears, having no strength to move nearer his master. So he recognizes him, and I'm getting very emotional, he recognizes Odysseus. He knows this is his master, and he doesn't even have the strength to lift his head. But he wags his tail as much as he can, and he tries to let him know that he recognizes him. And the man looked away. Odysseus looked away, wiping a salt tear from his cheek. But he hid this from Eumaeus. Then he said, I marvel that they leave this hound to lie here on the dung pile. He would have been a fine dog from the look of him, though I can't say as to his power and speed when he was young. You find the same good build in house dogs. Table dogs landowners keep all for style. So he's saying he looks like he would have been a good dog. He's trying to hide the fact that um, he recognizes him. And you replied, Eumaeus. So this is Eumaeus replying. A hunter owned him, but the man is dead in some far place. If this old hound could show the form he had when Lord Odysseus left him going to Troy, you'd see him swift and strong. So, excuse me, I, I haven't read this since last school year and I had forgotten. Eumaeus does not know who he is. Okay, he does not know who Odysseus is. He just knows he's this person he's helping. So he's a good man. He never shrank, shrank away from in, I'm sorry, he never shrank from any savage thing. He'd brought to bay in the deep woods on the scent. No other dog kept up with him. Now misery has him in leash. His owner died abroad, and here the women slaves will take no care of him. You know how servants are. Without a master, they have no will to labor or excel. For Zeus, who views the wide, wide world, takes away half the manhood of a man. That day he goes into captivity and slavery. So he's saying... No one has taken care of this dog, but when he was in his prime, he was wonderful. 
Eumaeus crossed the court and went straight forward into the Megaron among the suitors. The Megaron is like the, the big great hall, like the main meeting area. But death and darkness in that instant closed the eyes of Argus, who had seen his master Odysseus after 20 years. And this part always really gets me because it's like the dog is waiting for him to come home, right? The dog is waiting to see him again. And once he does, um, he dies, which is just kind of devastating. Okay, I'm just going to move on because I'm getting very emotional. The suitors. Let's look at these stand-up young men. That was sarcasm. They're awful. Still disguised as a beggar, Odysseus enters his home, so no one knows it's him. He is confronted by the haughty, which means arrogant, suitor Antinous. Okay, Antinous is a, a very arrogant, full-of-himself guy. But here, Antinous broke in, shouting, God, what evil wind blew in this pest? Get over, stand in the passage, nudge my table, will you? Egyptian whips are sweet to what you'll come to here, you nosing rat, making your pitch to everyone. These men have bread to throw away on you because it is not theirs. Who cares? Who spares another's food when he has more than plenty? So we do not like Antinous, okay? Antinous is saying, like, you're disgusting. Whips would be easy compared to what I'm going to do to you. We have all this extra food, and it's not even ours, so we can just throw it away and not even give it to you because it doesn't affect us. He's being a terrible guest. A terrible guest. And kind of a jerk. Not kind of. He's being a real jerk. With guile, Odysseus drew away, then said, A pity that you have more looks than heart. You'd grudge a pinch of salt from your own larder to your own handyman. You sit here fat on others' meat, and cannot bring yourself to rummage out a crust of bread for me. So he's really laying on the guilt pretty thick, and can you blame him? And here's question one, if you're doing this on paper. Then anger made Antinous's heart beat hard, and glowering under his brows, he answered. So he's like scowling at him. Now, you think you'll shuffle off and get away after that impudence? And impudence means... A quality of being shamelessly bold or disrespectful. So after you're so rude to me, you're just going to walk away? Oh, no, you don't. And I can't help but think like, no, he didn't. Snapping your fingers, shaking your head, real sassy. The stool he let fly hit the man's right shoulder on the packed muscle under the shoulder blade, like, so like solid rock for all the effect one saw. Odysseus only shook his head, containing thoughts of bloody work, as he walked on, then sat and dropped his loaded bag again upon the door sill, facing the whole crowd, he said, and eyed them all. One word only, my lords, and suitors of the famous queen. One thing I have to say. There is no pain, no burden for the heart when blows come to a man, and he defending his own cattle, his own cows and lambs. Here it was otherwise. Antinous hit me for being driven on by hunger. How many bitter seas men cross for hunger? If beggars interest the gods, if there are furies, which the furies are these three um, creatures. They are described as female spirits here. They're often shown as bird-like or demon-like who punish the doer of avenged crimes. So they're like, the furies sweep down and wreak havoc. Um, if there are furies penned in the dark to avenge a poor man's wrong, then may Antinous meet his death before his wedding day. So he's saying, man, he just threw a stool at me because I was hungry. What kind of man does that? I hope the furies kill you before you can get married. Then said, um, Eupithes' son, Antinous, so this is Antinous, enough, Eat and be quiet where you are or shamble elsewhere. Unless you want these lads to stop your, stop your mouth pulling you by the heels or hands and feet over the whole floor till your back is peeled. So he's threatening to drag him across the floor until the skin peels away from his back. Antinous is not a good dude. We do not like him. Um, here's question three if you're reading and do this on your own. 
But now the rest were mortified, and someone spoke from the crowd of young bucks to rebuke him. So the other suitors, not great guys, were like really offended by what Antonis has just said. And they say, a poor show that, hitting this famished tramp, bad business, if he happened to be a god. They're like, what if he's a god in disguise? What if he is a god in disguise and you've just thrown a stool at him and threatened to rip the skin off his back? You know they go in foreign guise, the gods do, looking like strangers, turning up in towns and settlements to keep an eye on manners, good or bad. So they're saying sometimes the gods are in disguise. Now this is kind of a throwback to just the previous section when Telemachus thought that Odysseus was a god in disguise. We also see that shown in the fact that Odysseus has lived through, like, he's lived past countless obstacles at this point, right? He's lived through um, the Sicones, the Cyclops, the Sirens, Scylla and Charybdis twice, the Lystragonians, um, Zeus, uh, the Helios. He's lived through all of these things. So he is a little bit godlike, even though he's just a mortal man. So here's another nod saying maybe... You've just made a god mad. Maybe he's a god in disguise. But at this notion that this beggar could be a god, Antinous only shrugged. Telemachus, after the blow his father bore, sat still without a tear, though his heart felt the blow. So he's doing what Odysseus said. He's not reacting. Slowly he shook his head from side to side, containing murderous thoughts. So Telemachus is kind of getting a little bit more, he wasn't, he was always brave, but he's getting more bold. Penelope, who is Odysseus's wife, on a higher level of her room, on the higher level of her room had heard the blow and knew who gave it. Now she murmured, so she's kind of talking under her breath. Would God, you could, would God, you could be hit yourself, Antinous. Hit by Apollo's bow shot. She's saying, man, if only Apollo would take his bow and shoot you with an arrow, wouldn't that be great if you would just die? So no one likes Antinous, okay? Because he is awful. And Eurynome, which I have to look at these pronunciations a lot for these, Eurynome, her housekeeper put in, he and no other... If all we pray for came to pass, not one would live till dawn. So she's like, just Antonis, like we want all of the suitors. We want all of the suitors to die. We don't like any of them. We want them to leave. They are taking everything out of our home. They've overstayed their welcome. They're awful. We want them all gone. Her gentle mistress, this is Penelope, said, Oh, Nan, they are a bad lot. They intend ruin for us all. But Antinous appears a blacker-hearted hound than any. So Penelope's saying, they're all terrible, but he's the worst. Here is a poor man come, a wanderer, driven by want to beg his bread, and everyone in hall gave bits to cram his bag. Only Antinous threw a stool and banged his shoulder. She's like, they're all terrible, but at least the other ones gave a couple of bites to this poor, poor beggar. So she described it, sitting in her chamber among her maids, while her true lord was eating. So Odysseus is eating. She doesn't know it's him, but he's down there eating the scraps that people have given him. And she's thinking about what a poor man he is. And he's down there eating. She doesn't know he's alive, right? Then she called in the forester and said, Go to that man on my behalf, Eumaeus, and send him here so I can greet and question him. Abroad in the great world, he may have heard rumors about Odysseus, may have known him. So, um, first of all, here's, your, here's question number four, right here. But I also want you to think about this. Um, in the live session yesterday, we talked about the fact that Odysseus can't trust Penelope because he doesn't know if she has found someone else if she even wants him to return. And here, you can kind of see that maybe she does. Like, abroad in the great world, he may have heard rumors about Odysseus. He may have known him. 
So here you can kind of see that maybe she does miss Odysseus. Maybe she's holding out hope that he'll return. So now we're going to read a little section about Penelope. And in my opinion, Penelope does not get enough airtime in this because I think she's a great character. Um, but we are going to get a little bit. So in the evening, Penelope interrogates the old beggar. And it's not like in like a cop show where they're like at a table and she's yelling at him. It's more just she's just asking him questions. She's just kind of seeing what, what he knows. Friend, let me ask you first of all, who are you? Where do you come from? Of what nation and parents were you born? So she's asking him nicely, right? Penelope is questioning him. Did I spell that right? Yeah. And he replied, My lady, never a man in the wide world should have a fault to find with you. Your name has gone out under heaven like the sweet honor of some God-fearing king who rules in equity over the strong. So equity means fairness or justice. So who rules fairly? His black lands bear both wheat and barley, fruit trees lad and bright, new lambs at lambing time, and the deep sea gives great hauls of fish by his good strategy, so that his folks fare well. Oh, my dear lady, this being so, let it suffice to ask me of other matters, not my blood, my homeland. Do not enforce me to recall my pain. My heart is sore, but I must not be found sitting in tears here in another's house. It is not well forever to be grieving. One of the maids might say, or you might think, I had gone maudlin over cups of wine. So maudlin means tearfully and foolishly sentimental. It's kind of like he's gone, like, maybe a little tipsy with his wine. He's like, I can't, like, my home, my homeland was beautiful and perfect. But it pains me to think about it. So please don't make me sit here and grieve over it or you're going to think I'm a little intoxicated. And Penelope replied, Stranger, my looks, my face, my carriage, or my posture, were soon lost or faded when the Achaeans crossed the Sea of Troy, Odysseus, my lord, among the rest. If he returned, if he were here to care for me, I might be happily renowned. But grief instead, heaven sent me, years of pain. So she's saying, it's okay to feel pain. My whole life has been kind of full of pain since Odysseus left, since my husband left and never returned. Sons of the noblest families on the island, Dilichium, Same, Wooded, Zacynthus, with native Ithacans are here to court me against my wish. So here Odysseus is learning that she does not want to be courted. This is not her desire. This is against her wishes. And they consume this house. They're not staying here. They're consuming everything. <sighs> kind of like a fire. Can I give proper heed to guest or suppliant or herald on the realm's affairs? How could I, wasted with longing for Odysseus, while here they press for marriage? Ruses served my term. So ruses are tricks. So she's saying tricks served her to draw the time out. First, a close grained web I had the unhappy thought to set up weaving on my big loom in the hall. So she's saying, I had to think of ways to draw this out to give Odysseus time to get home. I said that day, young men, my suitors, now my lord is dead. So she's saying Odysseus is dead. Let me finish my weaving before I marry. Okay. So she's working on this big tapestry, and if you guys have ever seen a loom, it's like you have these two things, and it's just covered in these strings, okay? And what the person weaving does is they will take one string, go to see some of my beautiful drawing again, one string, and they will they will go in and out, in and out, and then they have this, it's called a, a I think a shuttlecock maybe, shuttlecock, yeah, and it goes up, and it presses the string into the top and then they go through and they do the next string whoops and it goes up and it pushes it to the top and then it goes the next string and you get what I'm saying and you build the tapestry one string at a time um, so she's saying let me finish um, let me finish this tapestry before I get married or else my thread will have been spun in vain it is a shroud I weave for Lord Laertes. So this is a shroud. I'm weaving a burial shroud 
for Odysseus's dad when cold death comes to lay him on his bier. The country wives would hold me in dishonor if he, with all his fortune, lay unshrouded. So she's like, if I don't do this, I will be dishonored. I have to do this before I can remarry. I reached their hearts that way, and they agreed. So every day I wove on the great loom. But every night by torchlight I unwove it, and so for three years I deceived the Achaeans. So she's saying, I wove in front of them every single day. And then at night I would come in and I would pull the strings out. So I would just take them out and I would, I would basically rip it out. And I would take them out. I thought this would work better. Okay? So she's, she's taking them out. Every single night she's unweaving this thing. Which is pretty smart, actually. Um, sorry, I want to get that off there so I can take notes. But when the seasons brought a fourth year on, so she did this for three years. As long months waned and the long days were spent, through impudent folly and the slinking maids, they caught me. So the maids caught her, clambered up to me at night. I had no choice but to finish it. And now, as matters stand at last, I have no strength left to evade a marriage. So she finished it in year four, which means that for six years, um, well, I guess it was more like 16 years, somehow she's waited. And now, as matters stand at last, I have no strength to evade marriage. Cannot find... Nope, I'm so sorry. Let me go back for a second. It wasn't 16 years because she knew the Trojan War lasted for a certain amount of time. They got word of that, okay? So six years. She waited. And then finally they were like, he's dead. And she's like, okay, well, let me weave this shroud first. And she did that for three years. And then it took her a year to finally finish it. And now she's like, I just can't. Like, I'm, I'm done. I just ha I can't keep doing this. Cannot find any further way. My parents urge it upon me, and my son will not stand by while they eat up his property. He comprehends it, being a man full grown, able to over oversee the kind of house Zeus would endow with honor. So she has told him everything. Like, she just really... I mean, really opened up to him just then. She's like, listen, all this is happening. I don't know what to do. It's been a rough go of it. But you too confide in me. Tell me your ancestry. You were not born of mythic oak or stone. So she's like, listen, I've told you everything. Oh my God, why can't I do this? Everything. So now you, it's your turn. Tell me your story. Penelope again asks the beggar to tell about himself. He makes up a tale in which Odysseus is mentioned and declares that Penelope's husband will soon be home. You see then, he is alive and well, and headed homeward now, no more to be abroad far from his island, his dear wife and son. Here is my sword, sorry, here is my sworn word for it. Witness this, God of the Zenith, noblest of gods. So he's like, I swear by Zeus. And Lord Odysseus Hearthfire, now before me, I swear these things shall turn out as I say. Between this present dark and one day's ebb, after the wane, before the crescent moon, Odysseus will come. So he's saying, bef before the next night falls, you're going to have your husband back. And that's where this section ends. So most of the section is kind of used as like a backstory for what's been going on with Penelope, which we needed to know, right? Because as reader... Um, and here's the last question. As a reader, we don't know if she has turned from him or if she's still on his side. So this was a good way to, to realize that Penelope was faithful. Now, Odysseus has not been totally faithful. But we're just going to move on from that for now. Okay, so here's your reading for today. It is Wednesday, April 29th. This is for I Learn Day 30. Okay, it was originally I, I Learned Day um, 32, but after the, the switch, now it's I Learned Day 30. If you have questions, you can remind, text me, you can email me. We will meet today. Um, let's go ahead and meet at 3 p.m. instead of 2 because people seemed to like that better yesterday. So we're going to meet at 3 p.m. today to talk about it, and I'll see you guys then.